Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our welcome to the core trainees event at the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. This is a great opportunity to welcome you to the college and the work of the Psychiatric Trainees Committee. So um, I will hand over to our RC Psych Dean, Professor Subo Dave, who's going to give a welcome to you. Hi, everyone. So I'm not sure how many people we have. It looks like it's a small number. Is that right, um, Georgia? All right. So, um, well, hello. I'm Subodh. Uh, I'm a consultant psychiatrist. Well, very warm welcome to all of you. I had some slides, and um, I'm just wondering, given the fact that it's such a small number, I'm going to probably skip the slides. It probably seems a bit too uh, formal to talk with slides. I'm just going to try and have a brief conversation with you all. Feel free to put your hand up uh, or put something in the chat so that I can converse with you. We can have a bit of an interaction. I mean, if you'd be meeting in person, this would be this would be happening. Uh, you know, we'd be we'd be talking to each other. So. Um, and then we'd be having a conversation. So let's try and make it a little bit like that. So first of all, a very warm welcome to the Royal College of Psychiatrists. I'm not sure how many of you have actually been to um, 21 Prescott Street, but if you haven't, uh, please do visit um, uh, visit the place. This is our home and, you know, our family home, as it were. We are a small, small college, only about 20,000, getting up to 21,000 members across the world. And now you are part of that family, so a very warm welcome. Um, um, and um, I'm not sure whether how many of you um, actually heard of, you know, heard our president, Adrian James, uh, or or um, seen the portraits of our other presidents, but they're all in the in the building, and it's really nice kind of walk through history. There's a history wall as well. So it's, it's really a, a lovely building and I encourage you all to visit uh, visit. And if you do come, uh, please drop us a line and you know one of us are around, we will we'll, we'll love to show you around. So I just wanted to briefly touch upon how, you know, when I interact with you, this is one of the joys of being Dean is to kind of welcome people who are joining psychiatry. And I think it's a, it's, it's a little bit of a, a trip down memory lane for me, uh, thinking of the time when I joined psychiatry many, many years ago. And I think what really struck me, I think, is I started training, I, I joined psychiatry in India. I, I did that in Mumbai. And while I was in Mumbai, while I was training in Mumbai, I would have always thought, always thought of myself as a as a very um, competitive psychiatrist, conscientious psychiatrist, someone who really cared about my patients. Um, and the world was a little bit different to what it might be here. I think uh, even now, I think uh, I know we're all under pressure, but I think um, pressure and, and business, busy jobs were quite different as defined in Mumbai and probably are still so. Uh, I haven't practiced there in a long, long while, so I'm not sure how, how busy it is now. But certainly when I was there, you'd, you'd see anything between five to seven new patients in the morning and then 50 to 100 follow-up patients. And, you know, um, that was kind of a routine uh, afternoon, a uh, routine kind of outpatient clinic. And people would come in and crowd and wait from very early morning uh, till late afternoon and all the while I was there not once did I actually think that well why didn't I set up some kind of a registration system so that people can log in their details maybe go and have a cup of coffee and then come back and the reason why I tell you that story is because I think the central purpose of our science the central purpose of us being clinicians as being academic clinicians being scientific clinicians is to really provide good quality of care to our patients and I think of course it seems very obvious uh, but it can easily be forgotten. And so for you, as you embark on a journey in psychiatry, I really hope that that lesson, that everything that you learn, everything, every skill that you learn, every, every you know, um, training program that you go to, it really ultimately has to, uh, in some way, be in the journey of, of benefiting our patients. And I think um, that's, that's, for me, I think was an important lesson. I think that your science ultimately is only as good as it benefits your patients. Um, and so uh, as you as you take your first steps in psychiatry, I think for me, I think it's just a humbling reminder, uh, particularly for me, for, you know, I think um, you, you, must, you must think of me as a dean, somebody who's in, in charge of the curriculum and assessments and things like that, which I am. But honestly speaking, um, 
you might, while I work on a very big canvas at a national level, you know, I, I speak to, um, you know, I give evidence to ministers in parliament and try and influence um, the agenda for psychiatry. Ultimately, there is so much power and privilege we have in directly making someone we care for better, you know, I think. So in my clinical days, when I'm interacting with my patients, the, the, the privilege that you have, the, the actual power that we have of the the honor that we have of making someone better, I think is is difficult to to replicate anywhere else. And I hope that you don't lose that, you know, and you exercise that power responsibly because it's easy to to forget that we have that power. We, we you know we can all be caught up in, and I know we've just come from three day strike, and it's easy to kind of feel disempowered. But let us not forget that we actually have the power of influencing someone else's life and making their lives better, and, and let's use that power responsibly. And in doing so, I think learning from our patients, learning from our carers, I think is an important element. And and um, those of you, if you've had a look at our new curricula, that's what we emphasize. I think uh, the whole idea of person-centered care, how we place central importance on the individual and the whole person. So their biological makeup, you know, the composition of their, their brains, the their neurochemistry, um, but they also psychosocial makeup, you know, the, the kind of backgrounds they come from, all of that matters. And I think how do we use that in our formulations and how do we design individualized care plans, personalized care plans, precision care plans uh, is, is really up to us. And I hope that that's a skill that you will, you will learn. But in doing so, I also hope that you will not see yourselves mainly as interventionists. I think uh, one of the uh, powers that we have is actually making a difference to people's life even before they perhaps themselves have realized that they need it. So for example, now we know that adverse childhood experiences, you know, when people have had difficult childhood experiences, we know that that sets, that, that sets them up for difficulties later on. We know that if you have more than four adverse childhood experiences, the likelihood of you having a whole range of psychological, you know, mental illnesses and physical illnesses increases dramatically. So for us, I think then that gives us an opportunity to not just intervene, but also to prevent. And I think seeing ourselves as not just interventionists, but also as preventionists, I think is an integral part of our training. And that's something that we've put in our curriculum. It's something that we will be assessing uh, regularly through your workplace based assessments, but also in your paper A, paper B, and, and your CASC exams. And I think um, it just shows that for us, seeing yourself not only responsible for the care of your individual patient, but also for the care of your communities is, is important. And um, in, in doing so, I think we as a college, Royal College of Psychiatrists, are the first and pro probably the only postgraduate training program in the world that has made it a mandatory element of our, our training program. So it's in your core curriculum, and all of you will, will hopefully learn those skills and, and, and employ those skills for the benefit of not just your individual patients, but, but, but for the communities that you care for. And that is very empowering, isn't it? That that you can actually start making a difference, not just to your individual patients, but you also think about, well, what about the wider community? How many of them? Why are there health inequalities in my in my catchment area? Why is it there are certain populations, maybe people from ethnic minorities or refugee groups or, or women or, or you know, certain other subgroups? Why are they doing worse than others? And I think having that thought uh, will will always help you plan your services better, plan your and use your skills better. And in doing so, I think you will need a set of skills. I think you will need your core psychiatric skills. You will also need um, digital literacy skills. And I think um, all of you, I imagine, are pretty digitally literate already. Uh, unlike maybe someone like me, you know, who trained started my training many 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 years ago. Um, but having said that, I think there is still probably more we could do. And I think I hope that. It's not just digital literacy, but also data literacy that you will acquaint yourself with to get an understanding of what are your electronic patient records telling you, not just about your individual patient, but also about the catchment area and the community that you care for. Where can you get that information? Where can you get the information about the communities that you care for? What is the population level data? And all of this, I think, will also be, like I've said, assessing through our, through our assessment structures. So, um, so that's the kind of the broad journey I hope that you know you will embark upon in in in, in pursuing your career in psychiatry. And I think, irrespective of where you go, how where your career takes you, I want you to know that the college has your back. You know, we as a college 
are out there to support you, irrespective of whether you decide to stay in training or whether you come out of training, whether you decide to go through the higher training route or, or, or pursue the Caesar route, whatever you whatever route you take will will be there for you. And I, I want you to to access that support if you need it. Um, um, uh, there should be a link or by the psychiatric support service in the chat. Uh, don't hesitate to use it. Uh, we all know that um, doctors are often late in seeking help and to, to their own detriment. And I think, you know, I certainly feel that as psychiatrists, we should set the example in seeking help early and, and you know, benefiting from it. And that help is available. It's free and it's confidential. So, so do use it if you need it. Um, but, you know, the next few years, as you start learning, there will be a lot of, uh, I hope that you learn a lot. You show that curiosity about the subject. But I also hope that you have fun. And um, that's something certainly I feel very strongly that we learn best when we have fun. And if you haven't heard about it, we um, do have a look at our Mind Masters quiz. That's the new initiative that I launched last year. And it's been very successful. People loved it because it was a fun way of learning and acquiring new knowledge. And this time, again, we'll have 12 teams competing from across the UK at the Royal College of Psychiatrists International Congress. And do come to the Congress. It's a, it's a great event. Uh, it's a great networking opportunity. It's a great learning opportunity, great academic program. So certainly worth attending. And if you manage to get a place on your team, then you even get a free place to attend the Congress. So it's certainly worth looking at. So do, do come and join us um, and have fun while you're learning. And then finally, I think I want to end by, um, by, by saying that, well, a big thank you to all of you for choosing psychiatry. I'm really delighted to welcome you all and, you know, welcome to the can do and will do college, you know, so uh, feel free to uh, and make sure that you just uh, stay connected with us. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Subod. Does anyone um, have any questions they'd like to ask while we have Subod with us? So you can use either the chat function or the Q&A section um, the function. I believe you should both have, have access to both. So maybe while they're typing, Subod, um, if you had one piece of advice you could give yourself as a core trainee, if you could go back to that time, what would be your one, p your one key piece of advice? I think my one piece of uh, advice, I think, is to don't forget your strengths. I think uh, as a trainee, we all often think about deficit models and then you you end up looking at yourself uh, with a very critical eye. But uh, do, do actually use that critical eye also to focus on what your strengths are. And, you know, the reality is that all of us are a mix of our mix of strengths and weaknesses. Nobody is perfect. And, and, and that's true for all of us. We have our strengths and we have our weaknesses. And I think just focusing on your weaknesses alone is not very helpful. Focus on your strengths and use those strengths to overcome and compensate for the weaknesses that you would have. So that's something I learned a bit late, but uh, better late than never. Amazing, that's really helpful. Thanks, Ubaud. So we're now gonna pass over to Dr. Chris Walsh, who is the chair of the Psychiatric Trainees Committee. Uh, hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay, Charlotte? Is that, am I coming through all right there? Excellent. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, I'm just going to share my um, slides here. Um, so um, hopefully you should be able to see that. Um, Charlotte, just let me know if you can't or if there's any problems with it as we go along. Um, you, okay, cool. Thank you. Um, so uh, yeah, so it's nice to talk talk to you all. Welcome to core training. Um, so my name is Chris Walsh. I'm the um, Psychiatry Trainees Committee um, Chair for this year. Um, so we're a um, panel of about 40 or 50 reps across the UK who manage the um, kind of like training aspect of things from a trainee perspective. And we feed back to various committees and things like that. So I'm just going to take you through a little bit about our stuff over the next 10 minutes. Um, so, um, okay. Uh, so um, there's lots of QR codes um, through this. So if, um, if you see any of them, feel free to scan them um, if you've got your computer in front of you. Um, so um, the first thing you can see there on at the top um, is 
there's a um on the left hand side there's the officer's welcome message and it kind of gives us a bit of information sort of from the perspective of myself and the two other um exec officers about um the uh, ptc uh, but also so that you can find all the representatives in your local area by um either going to meet the ptc.com or scanning the qr code there at the bottom of the screen and um, if you want to get a bit more involved with your local ptc rep um I kind of recommend anybody speaking to the local PTC rep because it gets you connected with the college. You can find out more things that are going on. And um, uh, basically there's the one thing I guess I would say um, probably prematurely in this talk, because it might be a question later, that um, is a reason to get involved with the college is there really isn't anything that isn't covered, no matter what your um, sort of like project you're interested in or particular element of psychiatry or type of work that you want to do. And the college is so representative of the literal smorgasbord of um, psychiatry that happens across the UK. And so it can be really interesting and easy to get involved with that via us, because we can put you in the right direction of the um, college because although the college is a fantastic organisation, it's a large organisation which makes it complicated by nature. So being able to navigate it sometimes is, is something that we can help with. So kind of just thinking of where you sit at the moment in the middle of all this, it's a bit um, of a tricky one, kind of like working out where uh, this fits with everything, especially if you've just come from F2 because things are a little bit more streamlined during um, foundation training. Effectively, you've got your deanery or the school who are the people who actually deliver um, the, uh, the curriculum and the, the formula of how training should happen, which is set by the college. And then the trust then, um, if it's um, they, they either employ you directly or you're employed by the deanery, to do the work within the trust and that's where you get the exposure to be able to um uh you get the exposure to be able to um uh, be able to um, access the, the training needs that you have and then the BMA is a separate organization because that's our trade union so you sort of sit in the middle of all of these organizations which all speak to each other um, but the college have got a green tick there because you um in order to access most of the stuff that you'll use the college for including your curriculum it's all your portfolio you have to pay a membership fee which isn't a huge amount of money but um it does need to be done at the front end so that you're able to access all the stuff and um, and so our job in the middle of all this um is to um provide a trainee voice in all the stuff the college does the things like designing the training and creating the curriculums how they actually assess the method the the way we're um, performing um manages the e portfolio um setting standards for training and also the exams as well um so um, if we think of the structure of the PTC then, um, so the Psychiatry Training Committee, so there's you there who interacts with the deanery indirectly, you have your separate formal and informal links to the deanery locally, um, but the deanery links with the reps, just like you do link with the reps, and we have 40 reps across the country, and they then link directly with faculty, specialist groups, specialist interest groups, um, and subcommittees across the college, um, as well as interacting together as a committee, um, and as a committee then we have direct access to the main stakeholders. We have the college dean, who's obviously just spoken there, Spode. Uh, there's the dean for curricula, the chief examiner, the training management department, the events department, etc. cetera. Um, so it means that um, there's a cycle happening um, sort of behind the scenes between the PTC committee, the main stakeholders, and the main committees and groups in the college that is linked um, to the, this group of local reps who then link to you. So, it's, so it kind of means that you're represented by your local rep, um, but you also um, have access to the whole rest of the um, college via your local reps and the PTC committee. Um, so the main roles, the PTC, the first thing is, is that we always want there to be a situation where you feel like you know there's somebody to talk to you about how training works, how systems are approached and, and who to talk to if there's any queries. Um, they, we kind of the thing that we normally uh, do a lot of the time is we um, signpost people to different um other people in the college who are able to answer questions and fix problems and things like that um there were a really good first base if you're stuck you have to interact with so many different pieces of training um there's the portfolio and then you've got to do your you've, you've got to do your psychotherapy competencies and your exams and uh, your day-to-day -day work and stuff so it's a lot of things to keep moving and a lot of the time you do need some guidance with it and if you find that you're struggling to get guidance we can help with that um we feed back to the college and big issues like the curriculum exams and um, this kind of thing um, and then we have um committee 
meetings and with various deans and committees of the college about issues that are happening and um, and our college is excellent officers Sabode particularly um, is very receptive to um, the feedback from the PTC because he wants the trainees one of his sort of famous quotes is you know happy trainees equals happy patients and um, he wants us to be having good experiences and so we have close links and very informal and friendly and supportive links with the senior people in the college um, who are happy to hear us out and and to try and improve things where necessary um, and that obviously has a, a knock-on effect on improving patient care as I said um, so um, in terms of the academic part that we would be primarily involved in we're involved in the exams and we're involved in uh, sort of all different aspects of it we sit in lots of different committees to do with the exams in terms of how the exams may change or evolve um, we just recently announced that the CASC um, is um, uh, just go is going to be going back to face to face from September and um, sort of as long as the GMC um, sort of rubber stamped the decisions that have been made so far um, and that's a big change from last year um, where the um, obviously the cask is online and um, we were consulted and involved heavily in that sort of process. ARCPs and training obviously people have lots of questions about ARCPs at the moment because um, as part of the um, end of year review you'll be um, doing a new different version of the um, psychiatric um, supervisor report which is um, uh, you can't even generate if you've not done your PSPDP so it's a totally different system um, than, than if you're on the new curriculum than you would have had before so be us helping out with that and being able to guide people at this point in the year um, as well as reassuring people about things to do with industrial action affecting RCPs and things like that. Um, the e-portfolio is a big thing um, which we're working on as a, as a, as a big project um, and obviously the transitions with the curriculum and changes with that and usually we're able to help with things with those sorts of things um, and recruitment as well so we try to do a lot of work around to psychiatry and trying to improve um, the profile of psychiatry nationally as a training job um, because it's a great career um, and uh, one of the ways that your career can really flourish is by in, involving yourself with the um, RC Psych from an early stage um, uh, because of the opportunities, the um, in terms of reg jobs and even consultant jobs, the things that people are looking for in terms of management experience, research, audit, um, uh, doing things on a regional and even national scale, um, which can be incredibly impressive, um, come from um, starting small and building up in projects in the college. Um, I designed the leaflet a couple of years ago and here I am doing this, which is um, hopefully will sit nicely on my CV at some point, but obviously that's not my reason for doing it. Um, so um, aside from that, we do loads of educational events. These are supposed to be fun and interesting and bring people together. This was our last year's conference, national conference, which we held in London. It was the first face-to-face -face conference. So we themed it around the tube map. The idea being there's lots of different lines that people can take in their career in terms of the um, academic and clinical and non-clinical and psychological parts of um, being a psychiatrist. Um, this year, our um, psychiatric trainees um, committee uh, conference which is the national conference for trainees for the college and um, I, I sort of plug it a little bit here um, because it is going to be um, this May it's in Cardiff and um, it's called Psychiatry Beyond Prescription and it's a lot to do with the psych social aspects of psychiatry um, and it involves everything from we were having a, a speaker on anti-psychiatry almost as from a debate perspective perspective we're um, having people um, talking about um, psychotherapies that involve using um microdosing of like um, illegal drugs and various other things that are interesting um, but the most important thing is is that it's in a really cool venue that's like a um, sort of technological exploratory place that happens to have a lecture, lecture theatre um, it's 65 pounds for two days including all your um, your lunch and all that kind of stuff um, and um, this is the initial sort of program we've got um, there's a QR code there in the corner on the left that you can have a look at if you want to um, have a look at it but basically this is the initial program now, um, one of the big things that we're working on at the moment is looking at, um, at potential equity of things like study leave across the UK. Um, so one of the pilot pro projects that we're working on at the moment is making sure that all of the educational materials and events that we create, um, that we actually link them to um, HLOs um, so that it puts you in a position where they can actually be connected to pre-planning around your PSPDPs. All of this might sound like gobbledygook to you if you're CT1 and you're like, what is he talking about? But it sort of may make sense in retrospect 
correct. Um, and um, it's to do with like your portfolios and things. I've just realized actually probably I'm, I'm speaking yeah anyway the, you'll you'll understand as you go along with that but it means then it just puts you in a position that you can actually plan your study leave a bit better because you can say well this conference has been you know linked to this particular um hlo which is a curriculum item which means that therefore actually have, you know can be part forward planned as part of your um as part of your plan for study leave um we have a national magazine, um, which you can look at the current issue there by going to that QR code that's just recently been published. Um, this counts as a national publication to level one. Um, we had this checked and um, ratified um, last year, um, which means that if you're applying for um, reg applications, um, you actually get one point out of four just for publishing um, an article in this. Um, and um, so if you're a keen writer, would ever get in contact with us because um, yeah, some of the fantastic articles that we've had published recently have, have been really well received, so please do give us a shout. Um, we also work on a local level to produce lots of different um, sort of events. So, um, for example, um, I'm just, uh, I'm Northern Irish, I don't know if you picked up my accent, but, um, and so the, this was our um, national, uh, our regional conference last year, and this is our regional conference this year. Um, and we, so we produce events locally um, that are of a very high standard. Um, uh, which means that people can come together and especially post COVID, it's really important for people to have that experience of being able to to work face to face and to network and go for lunch and have coffee and meet each other. And um, yeah, there's there's many people in the college that um, I had met sort of like dozens of times online before I met them face to face. And there's an incredible synergy that happens face to face when you meet somebody and um, haven't I've only ever met them online before. So we're really pushing to have sort of really good quality regional events and also to have interpollination with those. We want people um, who like the look of this event to apply for study leave for it and pop over to Northern Ireland and meet some of the Northern Irish trainees and vice versa. So basically just um, summarising, what does the PTC mean for you? We want you to feel that, that all of, I've, I've given the perfect example of it in this talk. I've used loads of acronyms and things. These are probably like, what does that mean? How do all these things connect? Um, uh, the, um, basically, yes, I will wrap up, so apologies, I'm going over time. So basically we want things to be really comfortable for you and to work really well. So please do get in contact with us so that we can actually help you through some of this um, stuff. Um, and feel free to give us a shout. Um, so um, yeah, there's my email address. There's our PTC support email address. If you want to WhatsApp me this very second, you can scan that QR code. Um, but otherwise, just um, you can find our email address. Um, I think, yeah, they put the email address in the chat there. So so listen, sorry, I've gone a few minutes over, but thank you so much. It's, it's really lovely to sort of speak to you all and I look forward to meeting you face to face. Thank you so much, Chris, and sorry to rush you at the end there. Um, we're now going to go over to Dr. Ross Runciman, who is a consultant psychiatrist and was really heavily involved in the development of our new curricula. Good afternoon. Hope you can uh, hear me uh, OK. So fantastic. So, yeah, so following uh, Sir Bode and Chris, what, 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 a, what a tricky situation this is. Um, so very briefly, about five years ago, I um, uh, was on the psychiatric trainee committee, um, as, as Chris has been telling you all about, and had the opportunity to um, get involved um, with shaping the new curricula, which came out last year. So what I'd like to do over the next uh, 10 minutes is just give you a sense of what it's trying to do, what, what that means for you, what those ideas about the framework for learning in psychiatry means. And, and what you might need to go and do thereafter. I'll try and keep the, um, the ridiculous TLAs to a minimum, but it's, it's, it becomes a very bad habit. So if I, if I just move forward my little slides. Now, I, I'm not putting this on to be pedantic, but I get really confused about these things. And, and I used to be kind of quite, um, quite frustrated with people who would get particular about this. But, but actually, the language is really key. And I think in our specialty, uh, the wonderful specialty of psychiatry, language is, is, is everything. You know, our compassion is what defines us and the values uh, guide our behaviour. But the language is how we describe, how we engage, how we communicate. And, and so it, it kind of is important, even if it does feel a bit pedantic. 
So let's just think a little bit more widely about what's going on. So the GMC in recent years has tried to describe what all doctors do using these generic professional capabilities. And you can see these really broad themes connect with uh, the general themes um, within all healthcare from medical students uh, upwards. What we've been had to do then as a college um, over the last um, five years is translate those themes into themes that apply to psychiatry. And here you can see those GMC themes mapped onto things that mean a little bit more for us in psychiatry. And in 2022, what we did is created a program of learning, a framework to guide what you need to learn to become a psychiatrist um, and, and, um, and, and meet all the requirements of the job um, by, by looking about these high level outcomes, which map to those themes that we've discussed um, the GMC's generic professional capabilities. Now, obviously, there's an awful lot in those nine HLOs, and therefore, we just split them down a little further into themes. Now, this is just descriptors and a framework. So it's not, it's nothing that you need to take on board and have to hand to know straight away. But this is a, a way of guiding the, the accumulation of knowledge and skills. What this means practically and what the college has done over the last five years is, is uh, flesh out on the bones of that framework that we've looked at some information to understand how to navigate the learning environment effectively. So we can see on the top left about the psychiatry silver guide, which is akin to the gold guide that you have for all medical training, uh, but specifically looking at psychiatry. We've mentioned the broad curricula and we'll mention a few other bits as we go on, um, but all this information is on the college website. What the silver guide does in one place is tries to put all the answers to the questions that you may have. So you may say, how many workplace-based assessments do I need to do? You know, translating those things from F1, F2, where you have to do a, a, a mini KEX or a CBD um, into this framework. Um, or it might ask a question, you might ask a question such as what happens if I want to save some time out of training? And again, everything regarding that is in the silver guide. What the curricula ties to do, starting with that generic professional capability from the GMC, is then drill down in a practical way about the things that you need to learn. Now, what we've done, uh, going back to that theme of the language being important, is that those key capabilities sit under those themes, which sit under the high level outcomes. And those key capabilities, using the word capability is really key, because instead of being the competency that you can achieve to say, you're safe to drive your car, what we really want to foster in the language is a capability evolves over time. Just taking history as you'll all be able to do by the end of CT1, comparing with, what you'd be like if you were at the end of your training at ST6 or 7 and taking a history at that point. Similar skills, but at a different level. So the whole curriculum represents that helical structure of revisiting similar themes and similar high level outcomes throughout your training as you go through. Now, one of the most common questions that I get asked when talking about the curricula and, and this presentation, by the way, I've sent as a PDF so you can have it to reflect on uh, at a later stage when you've got time. Um, but one of the most common questions is around, you know, how many of these high level outcomes or key capabilities do I need to achieve? The answer isn't trying to be uh, obsequious, but is trying to be um, reflective of what they're trying to do. So. The key capabilities are a way of navigating through the learning that we need to do to get to the destination of the high level outcomes. So they're way markers. You could take this road, you could take another road. And the high level outcomes have to be achieved because that's what's required through the GMC to be a doctor in the round. So thinking about that answer to that question, I've tried to put in a, in a, in a, in a, in a in a more precise way. Those professional skills will touch on every aspect of what we do as a psychiatrist. Um, you know, 
in every job that you have as you're training, you're going to experience those professional skills and, and be, be needing to cover them in, in, in every job that you do. But reflecting about other high level outcomes, such as research and scholarship, may be something that you um, only cover on one placement where you happen to be with, for example, a professor who's doing research, and then you can join them in that endeavor. What matters is that you're able to put a little bit in your portfolio as to say why you haven't covered it on, on that placement, but that you will do in the future. So I'll leave that statement there. It makes more sense probably in a few months time. Um, so I don't want to overwhelm with so much information because that can get frustrating. Now, Chris mentioned about placement specific and um, personal development plans and that, and that, 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 sorry, professional development plans that, that I mentioned uh, um, is, is, is a really important way of unifying in that placement that you have or job that you have in front of you um, with the opportunities available there in that placement. So say, for example, I'm in Gloucestershire and if I went to an inpatient facility um, and, and I'd say, what learning opportunities are there available there um, with what is required in the curricula and what we're having as our milestones, as I said before, are those key capabilities. So this is one place that you do in advance that unites those different things so you can see what's expected of you and also what opportunities you have. So the best way that this is done, and many supervisors are, are ready and set up to do this with you, is for you to, 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 to have a sense and ask the supervisor what you need um, to learn or what the learning opportunities are for you in that placement. And they'll be able to tell you, well, Ross, we've got ECT uh, available in it here. We've got lots of um, Clark and new patients. You know, they'll be able to list those things off. And then at that point, you can go to the website um, which I've put at the link at the end of this presentation and get the information about an example um, developmental plan, which you can then start to furnish your own with on the portfolio. At the next review, probably a couple of weeks into the placement, then you can think about putting that and uniting with the information that your supervisor gave you about those learning opportunities and start to agree how you will show that you're achieving those things. So the biggest thing probably will be what workplace-based assessments, so which assessments on the job, will you do to achieve those key capabilities and then by proxy, those high-level outcomes? And then throughout the placements, you'll review these. So you'll go at different times and say, well, Ross, you, you are achieving that H and one around professional skills. This is the evidence for that. This is what you could do differently or, or better. To give you a sense of, of, of another big statement as well, which is really important thing to answer is, how do I know that I'm at the right level? And I think this is a really difficult thing to say, but as part of the curricula, and it's on the website, is these capability statements. And what it gives you a sense of, of by the end of CT1, where do I need to be? And this can be helpful um, in guiding your learning, but also guiding your supervisor as well. So we're almost at the end of our time on this segment, but the tips that I wanted to share with you and probably the most important thing that I've said today in my little piece is, is please click on this link at the very top here about the e-learning package. What this describes in this e-learning package, and it's something you don't have to do all or straight away. If you click on the link, it takes you through all the different items that we discussed today, but in particular, how to navigate the portfolio and get the most out for your learning opportunities in your placement. I've mentioned about capabilities rather than competencies and tried to reassure that you don't have to do everything in one placement. You've got three years worth of learning uh, uh, to do over six, likely six different placements. Starting early, um, as Chris said about the PSPDP is really important and working consistently through that. The last thing to say, is, is the sense in the workplace-based assessment of approaching standard is not failing. So that's a, a category of assessment. And sometimes it can feel like, well, if I'm not exceeding expectations and somehow I'm bad, the GMC is really clear on this. They want to see trainees of all different levels going through um, a placement at different uh, abilities. If you, wait, if you go on the placement on day one and you're already exceeding expectations, then that's confusing. So it's it's really part of the part of the course to have an approaching standard. 
So the final thing then is just to say here where all the resources are. This PDF will come out with all these hyperlinks in, and I'm really happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Ross. Um, so anyone in the audience, if you'd like to drop questions in the Q&A function, I'm sure Ross can stick around for a few minutes to answer those. And we'll hand over to Catriona Grant, who works within the college with our special interest groups, which you might have heard referred to as six. Hi, everyone. Um, let me just get my slides up. Bear with me just a second. Great. Can you see that, Charlotte? Yeah, sure. thank you. <laughs> um, perfect. Okay, so um, the special interest groups. Um, yeah, so my name is Katrina. I look after all the six um, at the college. Um, so aside from the faculties, um, which represent the main specialties within psychiatry, um, we also have 15 special interest groups. Um, so those provide a forum for discussion um, for members to come together in a particular area of interest, it does what it says on the tin, basically. Um, uh, each of the SIGs um, has two elected positions. There's a, a chair and a finance officer and then an informal exec committee, which is made up of um, unelected uh, members, but the, the chair and the a finance officer sort of bring together a group of people with um, an interest and ex expertise in the area. Um, so we focus on uh, lots of different areas, as I'll come to, but um, particularly looking at areas such as diversity, um, marginalised groups, history, spirituality, and other far-reaching areas. Um, so the uh, Adolescent Forensic uh, SIG is one of our oldest um, SIGs. It was founded 20 years ago to promote forensic mental health services for young people. Um, the uh, Evolutionary Psychiatry, or the EPSIG, um, you may have realized we love an acronym at the college, so uh, lots of them go by <laughs> shortened versions, but the EPSIC is, um, focuses on raising awareness of the contribution of evolutionary theory to psychiatry. Uh, the occupational, oh, sorry, going too far ahead there. Uh, occupational psychiatry um, focuses on the relationship between someone's occupation and their mental health. Um, then the Rainbow SIG, which promotes and researches the mental health of LGBTQ plus people. Um, and this SIG is closely involved um, in the college's pride celebrations. So you'll probably see members of the SIG involved in blogs and uh, webinars and things like that. Um, the Transcultural SIG uh, supports policy and practice to improve the care of uh, groups where culture is influential in the expression and management of mental distress. Also heavily involved in um, celebrations that the college does on South Asian History Month, uh, Black History Month, things like that. Um, then the art SIG um, provides a focus for psychiatrists interested in the arts and their role in mental health and mental health education. Um, we did a lot of um, really good uh, lunchtime workshops last year with the art SIG, um, which were quite fun. Uh, then the hop SIG, history of psychiatry. So uh, that was uh, created to encourage clin clinicians to research the history of psychiatry, um, improve the understanding of the subject and its value, including relating to current policy and practice. Um, sorry, my slides keep jumping. <laughs> um, and uh, you may have seen that we uh, recently had an exhibition on the history of eugenics, which the college hosted. So the HOPSIG was instrumental in getting that um, put in place. Um, the philosophy SIG uh, is one of our oldest. In fact, I think it is the oldest SIG. It's been going for about 25 years. Um, that was developed uh, to establish a dialogue between philosophers and psychiatrists. It's also got one of the largest memberships, I think uh, at least uh, a quarter of the uh, of our members are part of the philosophy SIG. Um, and they've recently launched a very popular book club. Um, and then the spirituality SIG has also been going for about 20 years. That was uh, set up to encourage uh, psych psychiatrists to explore the spiritual challenges presented by psychiatric illness and how best to respond to patients' spiritual concerns. Um, and then the WIMSIG, again, very heavily involved in International Women's Day celebrations that uh, were happening last week. Um, uh, yeah, Women in Mental Health, that's WIMSIG. 
Uh, so that uh, works to improve the mental health of women everywhere and also helps support uh, psychiatrists in their careers um, and influencing policy and things like that. Uh, then the digital SIG, that's our newest SIG, um, uh, focusing on technology and clinical practice, research insights, educational opportunities and community building. Um, and we had um, a fun debate at Congress that they hosted last year where one of the members um, came on stage in a robot costume. So that was quite fun. <laughs> um, neurodevelopmental uh, SIG, that's been going for a while as well. Um, that uh, seeks to promote a wider discussion and understanding of neurodevelopmental disorders across the whole field of psychiatry. Oh, sorry. I don't know why my slide keep doing that. Um, the PIP SIG um, represents the private and inde uh, independent practitioners within the college. Um, uh, sports and exercise um, covers the areas of, uh, of sport, exercise, physical activity, and how that relates to mental health. And then BIP SIG, uh, volunteering and international so we have they run some really popular uh, training weekends with the MH gap training um, and uh, focus on the work that psychiatrists can do to help um, uh, patients in need around the world so uh, we send out newsletters um, which keep our members up to date with what's going on with all the different SIGs so if you're signed up to the mailing list you'll get those and there's also information about the events that we put on um, so we do a mixture of online and in-person uh, events for our SIGs. Um, so if you keep an eye on the events page, you'll see what's coming up for each of those. Um, also at Congress, if anybody happens to be there, quite a few of the SIGs have uh, informal drop-in sessions during the break time. So you can come and meet some of the exec committee members, um, find out a bit more about what they do. Um, and then how to join if you aren't signed up already, um, you just need to log into your uh, college account um, uh, or go on the special interest group page on our website and it says in this yellow button there it says how, find out how to join the SIGs and then when you log in you get presented with all of them and you just tick the ones that you'd like to sign up to um, uh, but if you'd like any more information check out all the web pages there's loads of things about what the SIGs get up to on there and um, uh, the contact email which will come through to me if you if you have any questions or you want to be put in touch with the chairs then it's just SIGs at rcpsych.ac.uk um, and that's everything from me. Thank you so much, Katrina. We will head straight over to Ros Abbott, who's going to speak about our e-learning platform for trainees. Yes, hi everyone. Uh, just waiting for the slides. <clears throat> Thank you, Sarah. Um, yes, so I'm Roz. I'm e-learning manager at the college. So I'm just going to speak to you for a few minutes about Trainees Online or TRON, which is a revision tool designed to support those preparing to sit the MRC Psych Paper A exam. So it's free to access for anyone registered with the college as a trainee, member, affiliate, student associate or foundation doctor associate. So all you have to do is log in and it will automatically recognize your status and anyone not registered is required to pay a subscription fee of 53 pounds and that gives you a year's access. So the content on Tron is mapped to the paper A syllabus and the full mapping is available on the website for you to take a look at. Um, all of the modules are written by post membership trainees and are also approved throughout the production process by the exam panel before being signed off by them just before publication. Um, so a few facts and figures for you. So there's currently 58 published modules with five still in production, as well as a video based module on mental health tribunals giving evidence, which was produced in collaboration with the South West London and St George's Mental Health NHS Trust. Um, since its relaunch last year, there were 1,703 completions across all 58 different modules. And just to note as well that logging into Tron also provides access to the British Association for Psychopharmacology or BAPS um, online CPD resource free of charge and the link is on the website for you. Um, can I have the next slide please? Thank you. Um, so as part of eLearning's migration project, Tron is now hosted on the college's eLearning hub. So as mentioned before, all you will have to do is log into the hub using your details and you'll automatically have access to all of the content. So you can search through the catalogue using the selection tools available on the hub. Um, 
including content type, duration and category. And you can also search by using a keyword. If you'd rather, you can choose which module to select by searching through the syllabus mapping and working through them that way. Um, the mapping can be found in the support pages and it's broken down into each area of the syllabus and it links out to the modules for each of the topics. So once you've chosen a module, you just need to follow the steps to open the content and begin learning. Uh, next slide, please. The modules are built into our modern template, so they're fully responsive and have accessibility considerations built in. And you can navigate through them using the menu either on the left hand side of the page, as well as the uh, previous and next buttons located at the bottom of the page. And you can work through these at your own pace. Your progress is recorded and saved as you work your way through. So you can leave it and come back to it later if you'd like to. Um, all of the modules have learning outcomes that you can see on the screens at the beginning of the module, just to outline what you should know and what you should be able to do upon completion of the module. Uh, next slide, please. So they include a few different types of interactions just to try and keep you engaged as you learn. So you can see on the page there a click to reveal um, where learners click on each of the labels and the associated text appears to provide a bit more detail on each item. But we also include images, diagrams, videos, drag and drops, um, all to offer a blended learning experience. And recap questions are included throughout the module at the end of each section as well to help consolidate your learning, either in the form of EMIs or MCQs. Next slide, please. Once you come to the end of the module and all sections are complete, you'll be awarded a badge so that you can keep track of which modules you've completed. And this is stored in the award section of the website and is accessible at all times for you. Next slide, please. So along with the module content, um, a collated list of useful resources is provided by the author for each of the modules. So you can continue your learning and revise um, once you've completed a module. So this contains key reading, references, and any useful websites. We also offer take home notes. So you have a document containing all of the key takeaways from the module to keep as a handy revision guide. Next slide, please. So just quickly elsewhere on the hub, we also host CPD e-learning, which is a subscription based uh, e-learning resource primarily aimed at consultants based in the UK who are looking to complete CPD for revalidation. Um, but consultants aren't the only subscribers. We also have trainees, GPs, mental health nurses and psychiatrists working outside of the UK. Um, we also host a selection of free modules and podcasts that everyone has access to. You just need a college account to log in. So we have topical podcasts related to COVID, uh, the conflict in Ukraine. And we've also recently made the module Mind Your Language temporarily free to access to help support people with this newer aspect of the curriculum. Uh, the Hub also hosts the Congress webinar library and the Neptune modules, which are seven modules that cover the management of harms, resulting from the use of club drugs and novel psychoactive substances, which are free to access, so you don't need a subscription to complete them. Uh, final slide, please. So just to sum up, Tron is on the e-learning hub. You can see the URL there on the slide where you'll be able to find um, not only the modules, but also FAQs and support information, as well as the backlink if you want to take advantage of that discount. Um, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact us. Our, our team's email address is tron at rcpsych.ac.uk. We also have Twitter and our handle is at rcpsych underscore elearn. Thank you for your time. I'll pass back. Thank you so much, Roz. So in the interest of time, I think we're going to remove the Q&A session at the end. So if you've got any questions, please do use the Q&A function and our panellists will answer them on there for you. And I'll hand over to Fiona Watson, who's going to talk about the RC Psych Library Services. Hi, everyone. Um, so first thing I wanted to say is that all the library resources that I'm about to tell you about are free, so there's no downside to using them, please do get in touch if you would like to take us up on anything that I'm about to talk about. So I'm not going to use any slides, I'm going to give a quick demo in a second, but first I'll tell you a little bit more about the physical resources we have. So we have a traditional library, anyone who's been at the college will probably have noticed it on the ground floor. So you're very welcome to come in and study if you are based in London for those few. Um, anyone else, we mostly send the books that people borrow out by post. And again, that's free. You're responsible for returning them, but getting them delivered to you is uh, on us. So you can check the library catalogue online and then drop me an email and say, I'd like to borrow X, Y and Z. 
and I'll send them out to you. We do limit you to five uh, at a time in the post. Um, and anyone who has seen the books on the ground floor will uh, may not know that we actually have a lot more than that. So the books that we have on the ground floor are the more up to date ones, but we and if you've noticed the antiquarian books, so the rare books, the really old stuff, which go all the way back to the 1400s. But we have a large section of books which are somewhere in between. So all the stuff from psychiatry in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, that's all in the basement. So if you have a particular interest in psychiatry at that time, we have plenty of books. They're just not quite as visible. Um, and if you do have an interest in the particularly old books, you are very welcome to come and have a look at them. Those don't get borrowed, but if you want to come and see them, that's absolutely fine. You just need to book an appointment. So that's the physical books. Um, but most of what we do is all online. Um, as you know, all the access to research is primarily online these days, apart from people like to borrow exam books. So when you're getting ready for the CASC, if you want a physical CASC book, we have those in the library and uh, they are very heavily borrowed. So I'm going to share my screen. Let's hope this works. Clearly, it's been too long since I've been on Zoom rather than Teams. There we go. OK, so here we are. This is how you start finding the library stuff. So starting with Google, uh, easiest way to find the library is just to type in RC Psych Library. And we should pop straight up. So access to all our online resources is via Open Athens, and I'm going to drop a form for you to sign up for an Open Athens account if you want one in the chat in a minute. So you can read more about our services, you can check the library catalogue, but most of what you're going to want is behind this one, so access journals and databases. And this is your jumping off point. So there's a few things to highlight here. So we have the ebook for the Morsley Trainee Guide to the Cask. Uh, available there, should you wish to use it. Um, we also have Asylum, the Radical Mental Health magazine, which tends to have articles which are less likely to get published in things like BJ Psych or the other major journals, um, more patient perspectives, carer perspectives, sometimes psychiatrists writing anonymously, that kind of thing. So if you want to have a look, that's there. Otherwise, you can find all the journals behind this tab. We've got a wide range of ebooks that you can find there. And then we've got three of the major medical databases. Um, so I'll go into this in a second. The major medical databases, if you're getting to the point of wanting to do systematic searching in the databases, I'd highly recommend getting in touch. So we do training for those who haven't searched them in a while or aren't very confident with them or you can request the library to run a literature search for you um, and we'll send you out a bunch of articles um, on the topic of your choice and what we do in terms of that varies quite a lot so we do anything from helping with systematic reviews where we'll look at your protocol with you go through look at your search terms formulate a question run the searches for you and export the results provided they're on the databases that we use anything to at the opposite end of the spectrum, had an email from someone today who said, I'm interested in the uh, development of mother and baby units. Can you just send me 50 articles? And it's like, fine, I'll send you 50 articles. So whatever you're looking for, we should be able to help with. Um, so if you wanted to look at a journal, you could just say, I'm interested in academic psychiatry. That's when it's going to ask you to log in via Open Athens but it only asks you once a day. So I'm already in there today. And then you can just use the links to hop out to the publisher's website and you'll already be logged in. So it should be really simple. If you're doing more complex searching or you're doing a literature review, anything where you're gonna to have to evidence your research, please do get in touch. I can help you access uh, software which will help you manage articles between a research team or set up better access to open access articles using a browser extension. There is a lot that we can help you with, so please do let us know if you have any questions. So I'm going to stop talking now unless anyone wants to jump in with questions, and I'm going to drop a link to sign up for an Open Athens account in the chat, and I'll put my email address in there as well if anyone has any questions. 
Thank you so much, Fiona. I think that's really helpful overview for our trainees. Um, so that brings us to the end of the event today. If anyone has any questions, there's still time to drop them in the um, Q&A box. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much for attending today. We hope it's been helpful. And thank you so much to all of our speakers for volunteering their time today. Um, if you've got any questions to follow up, please just drop us an email. It will be specialty training at rcpsych.ac.uk and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>